Well, good evening and welcome to my tutorial on shooting landscapes by moonlight. I'm here at one of my favorite places on the planet, Waterton Lakes National Park in southwest Alberta. The scenery is fabulous. And so tonight, it looks like the skies will be too. And tonight, we've got a waxing gibbous moon over in the southeast. That's going to be our main source of illumination tonight. So the plan is to shoot landscapes lit only by moonlight. The results can look great. Familiar scenes appear with stars set in a deep blue sky. And yet the technique is as simple as it gets in nightscape photography. Here's what you need. To shoot moonlit nightscapes, any good low noise camera will produce great results. A DSLR camera or a mirrorless compact system camera will both work well. For lenses, any of the lenses you use for daytime landscape photography will work at night, but most scenes call for fast wide angle lenses. As with any night photography, you'll need a solid tripod, and exposures are typically 10 to 40 seconds at f2.8 to f5.6 and at ISO 400 to 1600. Now, exactly what exposure to use, I can't tell you. Unlike the sun, the moon changes in brightness quite a bit through the month as it goes through its phases. For example, a night with a full moon will require exposures two or three f-stops less than a night with a quarter moon. Exposures also depend on how high the moon is and on how clear the sky is on the night that you're shooting. A low moon in haze will provide much less illumination than will a moon shining high in a clear sky. While it's easy to take test shots to nail exposure, Getting the best shots requires balancing the three opposing factors of the exposure triangle. Now shooting at night, even on a bright moonlit night, requires long exposure times, wide apertures, and high ISO speeds. Shutter speed, aperture, and ISO are the three ways you have of adjusting exposure. We call them the exposure triangle. Increase one factor, and you can decrease one or both of the other factors. You can increase ISO speed, enabling you to shoot at faster shutter speeds, or smaller apertures, but noise levels go up. Opening up the lens to a wider aperture also allows you to decrease exposure time, or use a slower ISO speed. But that makes the depth of field very shallow putting the foreground out of focus. Stopping the lens down for more depth of field so that both the foreground and sky are sharp requires higher ISO speeds or longer exposures. Exposed for too long, Earth's rotation will turn the stars into trails. Now the 500 rule suggests that the maximum exposure you can use before trailing becomes obvious is 500 divided by the focal length of your lens. So with a 24 millimeter lens, a typical landscape lens, the maximum exposure for untrailed stars is about 20 seconds. How you juggle the exposure triangle depends on your scene. If you have a foreground that needs to be sharp, stop down and boost the ISO speed. If not, open up the aperture and use a lower ISO speed for lower noise. But don't get so wrapped up in technical settings that you forget to compose the scene well. The rules of composition, such as the rule of thirds, or the use of elements leading your eye into the scene, are just as important at night under the moon as they are during the day under the sun. And as with the sun by day, if you shoot toward the moon by night, you can get some nice silhouettes. Just beware, the moon can introduce lens flares and reflections. Always remove any filter you might use on your lens. Now shooting away from the moon yields well-lit landscapes. However, before you compose the scene, take care to focus. Now autofocus won't work at night. You need to use live focus. Focus on a horizon feature or on a bright star or light in the distance. Do that earlier in the evening perhaps when the scene is brighter, making it easier to see an image on your live view screen. Then take a test shot and check that the foreground and the background are both as sharp as you want them to be. Mm -hmm. 
Now once you have the camera set and the scene composed, you could be happy just taking single still shots and then move on to another location. Or you could stay put for a while and take 200 to 400 shots in rapid succession using an intervalometer in order to create frames for a time-lapse movie. As the sky turns and the moon moves across the sky, shadows and lighting will shift. A waxing moon will set late in the evening, causing the sky to darken. Or a waning moon can rise late at night, causing the landscape to light up. Now, apps like PhotoPills and the Photographer's Ephemeris can help you plan a shoot, showing you where the moon will rise and set on a given night. Whether you shoot stills or time lapses, enjoy the night and the beauty of scenic landscapes under a very different light. Well, what a great weekend that was in the Rocky Mountains at Waterton Lakes National Park. The weather was fabulous. Um, I was teaching some workshops on a couple of nights, uh, but shooting a lot of my own pictures. And I've imported them onto the hard drive, pointed Adobe Bridge at them, and here they are. Uh, so here's a selection of pictures here. I've already gone through them and given them various color labels and star ratings. Uh, all the red images are part of a, a panorama set. All the yellow images are part of a high dynamic range set. The one I'm going to pick for our demo purposes here is this five-star rated image here, um, shot by Moonlight at Red Rock Canyon. So the workflow I'm going to use to process this sort of sample image goes from Adobe Bridge into Adobe Camera Raw to develop the image. And remember, out in the field, I advise you to shoot raw with the camera. Uh, and then we'll go into Photoshop for a little more work. Um, we'll apply some smart filters and some adjustment layers and some masks so we can process the sky differently from the ground. It's, it's something you can do in Adobe Camera or in Lightroom if you prefer using what's called local adjustments, but it's so much easier with Photoshop with the precision of masks. So that's the agenda today. So let's get started. So we'll start with Adobe Bridge, and here's our image in Adobe Bridge, the one that we've picked out for demonstration purposes. Double click on it, and it opens up in Adobe Camera Raw, the raw development engine within Bridge, or it lives within Photoshop as well. And whatever I do here to Adobe Camera Raw, you could do with Lightroom as well if you prefer. Uh, the develop module in Lightroom is exactly the same as ACR. Um, so, I've already gone through it in this case and done most of the development. So, let me just step through what it is I have done. First of all, let's start over here and to the right on the Effects tab. As of summer 2015, there's a new tool here called Dehaze that's in Camera Raw or Lightroom. And even on a perfectly clear night like this, it really does snap up the contrast in the sky a little bit. So, a little bit of Dehaze applied. Then next is Lens Corrections. And if I turn it off, we get darker corners, uh, a bit of a dingy look to the image. Snapping it up really brings up the brightness of the corners, gets rid of vignetting, flattens the field, gets rid of some of the lens distortions. It did that automatically because it knew what lens was attached to the camera and applied the appropriate correction for, in this case, the Canon 24 millimeter lens. So that's Lens Corrections. The next one I touch here is detail, which is sharpening and noise reduction. Um, sharpening I kind of leave at the default of 25. The color, chrominance noise reduction, I leave here at its default of about 25. But the luminance, and I'll zoom in here a little bit so you can see the difference. The luminance I brought up to 30. And if I turn luminance off by toggling it off here, there it is. You can see that it's a lot grittier and grainier uh, with luminance at zero, which is what the default setting is. So for the high ISO shots that we typically shoot for even moonlit nightscapes, bringing up that luminance noise reduction, in my case here to about 30. If you go up 
higher, 40 or 50, it's sometimes necessary, but you may start to blur out fine detail in the ground. So that's a luminance noise reduction of about 30. So zooming back out again and going to the basics panel. This is where most of the work is done here and I've already adjusted all the sliders. You can adjust the color or white balance here by adjusting the temperature or the tint sliders to correct for some slightly off color color balance. So it really didn't matter what your color balance was at the camera. You can set it here wherever you like. Exposure I brought up to about half a stop brightness increase. I brought up the contrast a little bit and brought up the highlights. Usually this is where you recover highlights by bringing this down uh, to recover detail in very bright areas, but there weren't really anything like that in this picture. So I brought up the highlights just to snap up the whites a little bit. Brought up details in the shadows here with the shadow recovery and then brought up the clarity to snap up the mid-tone contrast. Brought up the vibrance, again, really brings out the blues and the reds in the ground here. You don't want to go too crazy with vibrance and certainly not with saturation where it just gets blown right out. So a little goes a long way with saturation. So very quickly with those kinds of adjustments, if I turn everything off, that's before. That's without any of those adjustments applied. This is essentially what came out of the camera. Uh, I well exposed uh, fairly well and, and certainly for sharply focused, but looking rather flat, turning on all those adjustments with camera raw really improves the image quite a bit. So again, before, after, looking pretty good as is. We could be happy with that right now and just save it off and call it done. But let's take the image into Photoshop, do a little more work with it, and particularly processing, processing the sky separately from the ground using Photoshop's ability to create masks. Now to open this image, this developed RAW file in Photoshop from Adobe Camera Raw, where we are now, you just come down here to the Open Image button. Only I like to hold down the shift key, turns it into open object. And now when we hit it, Adobe Photoshop opens up, but opens up that image as what's called a smart object. And a smart object allows us to apply non-destructive smart filters and other adjustments to it to continue our non-destructive processing. You can tell it's a smart object because just down here in the bottom right corner is this little insignia. And the nice thing about it is that if we just double click on that smart object, the image opens up again in Adobe Camera Raw and we can readjust any of those sliders if we've decided to change our mind and wanna tweak things again. I won't do that in this case, but again, it's part of the non-destructive processing. We can go back and change any of those earlier settings even as we proceed further along with some smart filters. Well, what kind of smart filters can we apply to the image at this point? Well, lots. Under filter, there's all kinds of filters we can apply, but let's just do a couple. Noise, reduce noise. Dialog box comes up to allow us to dial in the strength, the details, color noise separately here. Those are kind of my default settings. Hit OK. And it applies another subtle level of noise reduction, primarily noticeable in large areas of sky like this. If I zoom in once again, that's with, without, with, without, just smoothing out noise a little bit further. Uh, another thing we can do, noticeable a little bit more in details like this, is a little bit of sharpening. Come down here to the sharpen. And Smart Sharpen is one of the nicer sharpening filters we can apply. Those are again sort of my default settings. Uh, you can adjust the amount of sharpening in the shadows differently from the highlights so you don't sharpen noise in the shadows. And applying the sharpening filter just snaps up the detail a little bit further here in the image. So we'll see with it applied. There it is without, with, and without. 
And should we decide that we don't like any of those settings or we do want to adjust them, the nice thing about smart filters is that you can just double click on the filter itself in that smart image layer. And it opens up again, in this case, the smart, sh smart sharpen and allows us to just readjust that or just turn it off entirely. So it's always non-destructive. You can always go back in and change your mind at any time and readjust smart filters or just remove them entirely. So non-destructive filters applied to a smart object. Well, one of the other tools at our disposal to continue the process of non-destructive editing are what's called adjustment layers. They live over here in the adjustments panel. There's all kinds of them. I'll just do a couple. For example, brightness and contrast. Clicking that adds a brightness and contrast adjustment layer, which affects everything below it. Bringing up the brightness, bringing up the contrast, affects the whole image. There is a mask on that image, but it's white, so it's really not doing anything. What if we wanted to adjust just the sky separately from the ground? To do that, we need to mask out the ground and apply an adjustment just to the sky. So to do that, we have to, first of all, select the sky. And one of the easiest ways to do that is over here called the Quick Selection Tool, right there. So let's grab our Quick Selection Tool we can make it a little bit larger with the right bracket key or smaller with the left bracket key. Go up a little bit larger here. And now just select across the sky and our little marching ants here kind of show us uh, what we've selected. It's done a pretty good job of selecting just the sky. But clearly there's lots of little bits that it's going to miss here in between the trees, all around these intricate branches. How are we going to do that? Well, the trick to that is up here, Refine Selection Edge. Hit that, and a red kind of ruby -less layer comes up here to sort of show us the mask that we're going to create. Uh, we can turn on this Smart Radius. That might help, but really we want to adjust or bring up the brush size here, and then paint across the trees. And continue all the way across the horizon here. And you can see from the mask that it's already done a pretty good job now of selecting just around the tree branches. Now right in here is a little bit tricky bit. Paint all the way across there. Here, eh, it's missed a little bit in there. Bring it up a little bit larger might help. And now you can see from the mask that we've really very quickly selected the sky, masked out the ground, even around those intricate areas around the tree branches. Clicking OK gives us our selection again here. And now if I hit a brightness and contrast adjustment layer, there it is, there's our new adjustment layer with the mask applied from that selection. So now as I adjust contrast, bring down the brightness here, bring up the contrast. Again, after, or before rather, after. So there's our brightness and contrast layer applied just to the sky and not to the ground with a mask that took just seconds to create using the quick selection tool and the Refine Edge tool. Well, what other kinds of adjustments can we make to an image? We often want to adjust the color of the sky separately from the ground. And one of my favorite tools for doing that is over here, again, Adjustments Panel, Selective Color. Click that button. It adds a Selective Color Adjustment layer. But it's affecting the whole image. Just making extreme changes here, you can just kind of see that because it, it has just a white mask on it. It's revealing the whole image. Well, we need to add the same mask as we just added down here. Well, we don't have to reselect and refine the edge yet again. We can just select that mask, hit Option or Alt, and drag that mask to the new image layer we just selected. Now it has the same sky mask on it. So going back here to these adjustment sliders, 
We can adjust all kinds of colors separately here. But if we adjust the neutrals, we can take out some yellows, which adds some blues, or add a little more yellows, add a little more magentas in, or take them out. So we can affect the intensity of the sky here quite a bit, our blue moonlit sky. And so selective color really helps in changing and affecting the sky, uh, definitely from the ground in this particular case. But now what if we want to add some ground adjustment layers? How do we do that? Well, how do we create an adjustment layer that now applies just to the ground, not to the sky? Well, it's pretty easy to do. We just continue what we were doing. Come down here to our adjustments panel again. Let's say we want to add a brightness and contrast layer. Click on that. There it is, our new layer, but it's affecting the whole image. Take our mask from below, Option Alt, drag it onto our new adjustment layer. And there it is, but of course it's still the same. It's, it's revealing the sky, concealing the ground, black where the ground is. We want it the other way around. Well, very easy to do. Click on the mask. Up here under Mask Properties is Invert. Or just hit Command or Control I. And now what was black is white and vice versa. So now the black is concealing the sky. The white is revealing the ground. And if we go back to our Mask Properties, click on here to get at the actual sliders themselves, you can see that whatever adjustment I make to that adjustment layer is now affecting just the ground and not the sky. And so these masks are editable at any time. We can go in under Mask Properties and feather the mask if we like, change its density here if we like, or we can even refine the edge of the mask yet further. Say we weren't happy with that refined edge that we did earlier on. As we look at it more closely, we see the, there's still little bits of around the trees and the branches that aren't properly masked. Well, just hit Mask Edge. Exactly the same dialog box comes up as before Refine. And we can see, in fact, that there is a little bit of blue sky showing through here. Brush over that again and it's gone. Brush over that again, and that's gone over there. So we can always refine the mask a little bit further at any time, even weeks later if we, if we wish. So masks are non-destructive. The adjustments themselves that we're doing to these image layers is non-destructive. That's one of the most powerful features of Adobe Photoshop. Not only the smart filters, but these editable and maskable adjustment layers. Well, now with a little more care, uh, here is our finished image with our smart object, a couple of smart filters applied, and four adjustment layers, two for the ground, two for the sky. Just to clean things up a little bit, we can select, say, the two ones for the sky, and then right-click just to the right of them. The menu comes up where we can group from layers, and we'll call those the sky layers. And we'll give them a color. And because the sky is blue, we'll make it blue. There we are. So we've added those two adjustment layers into a folder, which we can now turn off and on at once, but reveal it. There's our two adjustment layers. Once again, select the two for the ground, right click to the right, group from layers, and those are our ground layers. And we'll make the ground red, because it is red there, at Red Rock Canyon. And there's our ground layers, off and on. And there they are, they're in a folder called ground layers. So it's just a way of sort of cleaning up, doing a little housekeeping in Photoshop, just making things a little neater. We've only got four adjustment layers there, but you can easily build up dozens of adjustment layers and other kinds of adjustment uh, uh, filters as well. And so it really helps to group them and organize them. Um, so there we are. Sky layers off, on. Ground layers off, on. So even though the image looked pretty good in, in Adobe Camera Raw, we've made it even better here. 
Now you want to save the image and of course come up here, save, command or control S, but, and you want to save them as a Photoshop layered file. You do not want to flatten the image because you'll lose all those adjustment layers. You'll lose the smart object, you'll lose the smart filters. So always save as a layered Photoshop file. That's your master file. You can then flatten it later and save it as something else to do something else with or reduce the size and put on Facebook or whatever. But always keep this layered master file uh, to work with to create other kinds of versions of it later on. So that's just the basics. There's much, much more we can do, but that's just a little basics of the two most powerful methods you have of non-destructive processing in Photoshop. Smart filters and adjustment layers that you can apply masks to. So that's a very quick look at processing, shooting moonlight uh, images, and then some of the common steps you need to process them later on. So as you can see, shooting moonlit nightscapes out in the field, and then processing them later at the computer is fairly easy to do. Now, I didn't touch time-lapse imaging at all in this tutorial. If you can shoot one well-exposed moonlit scene, you could probably shoot several hundred using an intervalometer here uh, to fire the shutter automatically for you for several hundred frames. A couple of my other tutorials on the Northern Lights Aurora and on uh, Star Trails covers the process of taking several hundred process RAW files and turning them into a time-lapse movie. So check those out. I also invite you to check out my 400 page ebook if you'd like to learn a lot more about shooting and processing all kinds of nightscapes and time lapses. It contains dozens of embedded HD videos and step by step tutorials in an interactive and multimedia format. But I hope you've enjoyed this quick introduction to moonlit nightscape techniques. I leave you with a short montage of moonlit scenes. Thank you for watching, I wish you clear skies and happy shooting under the light of the moon. <laughs>